present uh, my research project, although I will be focusing on some parts more than on the others, but let's start from, from the very beginning. Anna has already said who I am, so precisely I'm psychologist by training and social demographer by training. And um, two years ago, three years ago, almost, I received the National Science uh, Center grant, um, NCN grant, Polish grant, for conducting the research on uncertainty, ambivalence, and indifference in reproductive decision making. And this grant is precisely dedicated to people who want to form research teams. And this is what happened. So basically, thanks to this grant at the Institute of Psychology at the university that I'm working, so Cardinal Stefan Wyszynski University in Warsaw, uh, we formed uh, a research center, Center for Individual and Family Life Course Studies. And within, within this center, uh, there is a growing uh, number of people working with me on topic of reproductive decision-making, not only on uncertainty and ambivalence in reproductive decision-making, but more generally on psychological determinants of reproductive decision-making, because this was basically the main idea behind the whole ground and behind the center to bring more psychology into the uh, um, studies on reproductive decision-making. And before I move on and show you what we're working on, I just want to give you a short a brief overview of the research team. We are definitely female dominated team. Uh, today it's International Women's Day. So actually it's uh, very much in line. Uh, so I have at the moment four PhD students working with me. Uh, so Joanna Lechniak, Isabela Huczewska, Isabela Malicka and Marta Bryzek. These are all my PhD students. Um, Dominika Kalaś, uh, she's a postdoc who's supporting me with um, supervising the student, but she also uh, is at the moment developing her own research within the team. And we are also collaborating with a couple of other people. Um, you, you, you recognize some of the names. So for instance, Zuzana Brzozowska has been collaborating with us a little bit, Alice Raybould. Um, but we are also very proud and happy to have uh, Professor Warren Miller collaborating with us. And also with the increasing frequency, I'm trying to engage master students into the work of the, of the research center. Uh, and I believe at the moment, uh, all, my, all, all the ladies that are mentioned here and showed here should be in the audience. So I hope that uh, they will also support me maybe in the discussion part, but uh, what I will do at the moment, I want to acknowledge that this presentation is also partially their um, presentation. So it's not only my work, it's their work too. The aim of today's presentation is precisely to give you the overview of our work. So what I will show you, I will share some overall theoretical assumptions of the, of, the, of the project, and I will give you a brief overview of the current work and of our research plans. Uh, so it will be a little bit mixed of everything. I will show some, initial, some very tentative results, but I will not be going into much details with the studies. Of course, we are very happy to answer any more detailed questions afterwards. But my main aim is really to give you the, the overview of what we are doing. I think it's uh, really very important really to uh, exchange at the early stages uh, of work. So everybody knows who is working on what to give space for some collaboration maybe and some uh, idea development for future, for future research. All right, so uh, let me start with saying that a very important element of the whole research project and the starting point for the whole research project, project was a notion of fertility intentions. So basically fertility intentions, childbearing intentions, uh, this is something that has been on demographers agenda for really a long, long time. So it's not definitely not only psychologists who are interested in intentions, demographers are heavily investigating intentions. And actually I found a very nice um, review, book review written by Ogin Grebenik, so one of the 
founding fathers of demography, of one may say, uh, who actually wrote a very nice review on the book that was written in 60s, as you can see, a long time ago. And this study documented the growth of America family study, which was really like the first study in which the researchers tried to use questions on fertility expectations plans to improve uh, predictions, forecasts of fertility in future. So this is how intentions got into demography. And actually, they have been really very important, very high in the research agenda for many demographers, but not only from the perspective of forecasting, uh, predicting future fertility trends, but intentions are also very, very important for those researchers who are interested in the process of reproductive decision making. So because at the moment, uh, well, basically we assume that reproductive decision making is a conscious choice. We have quite, uh, in developed countries, we have uh, good control over uh, our reproductive behaviors. So researchers were looking, are looking into different models of how the decision to have a child is really made and intention is a core, a core component of this decision-making processes. And actually, uh, some of you might be familiar with several different models of reproductive decision-making that are used in demography, in population studies. And all of these models, they refer to fertility intentions. So like theory of plant behavior of Itzhak Eisen or Trites Desires Intentions Behavior Model of Warren Miller, or the more recent cognitive social model of fertility intentions introduced by Christine Bachra and Philip Morgan. These are all models of reproductive decision-making that are being used in population studies, and all of them are centered around the concept of fertility intentions. Basically, all these models see fertility intention as mental state, psychological state that directly precedes behavior. So, this is something that uh, they are looking at. All of these theory, there are some differences between these uh, theoretical models, but they have one other common uh, element. They all have a common, the same or very similar starting point. In all of this model, some kind of mental representations of childbearing and affective response to those images are the starting point of the whole reproductive process. So we may say that on one hand, intention, the, the plan to have a child, the precisely defined idea when to have a child, this is something that precedes the behavior, but at the beginning of the process, of course, it all begins with attitudes, perceived values and these values of children, motivations, mental schemas. There are different terms used in different theoretical models, they are slightly, there are some slight differences in how these concept are, concepts are um, described, but basically all those concepts go down, it can be narrowed down, that they are some mental representations of uh, different aspects of childbearing, what childbearing entails, what childbearing, what parenthood means, and some affective reaction to those images. They are at the beginning of the whole story. And in our research project and uh, in most of our work, we actually use the terminology uh, coined by Warren Miller. Miller model is the model that we mostly refer to. And in his model, the first stage of the decision-making process, the motivational sequence that leads to childbearing starts with so-called motivations. And he defines these motivations as general predispositions to react favorably or unfavorably to different aspects of childbearing. So there are positive motivations. These positive motivations are predispositions to focus more on the benefits of childbearing, to see various positive aspects of childbearing as highly desirable. And there are negative motivations, uh, which are 
which can be described as the overall tendency to react in a negative way to various aspects of childbearing, to focus more on costs or on these values of, of childbearing. Uh, what's important is that according to the model, and uh, actually uh, Miller did quite extensive research on that uh, in his academic career, uh, these motivational uh, dispositions are formed from very early childhood. There is even some evidence about um, uh, um, genetic, genetic predispositions for uh, these uh, negative and positive motivations. So they are formed from early childhood and they are relatively stable. I'm saying relatively compared to, for instance, fertility intentions. We know that fertility intentions can change a lot over the life course. They depend on your age, on your personal situation, on your union status. But these motivational uh, predispositions are more like traits. Actually, in Miller model, in Miller's model, uh, Miller often refers to them as to motivational traits or motivations. They are more stable. They are, of course, developing over the life course, but they also appear much earlier in the uh, course of individual development. Um, and as I said, there are different terms used in uh, literature, but we may say that these motivational traits, these motivations, uh, can be perceived as similar to attitudes towards uh, different positive or negative aspects of childbearing. And uh, there is one other reason why we focused on when we, when, why we have chosen Miller's model as our theoretical framework. Uh, the reason was also that in Miller's model, and this is something that is um, that makes this model different from Eisen's model or from Bachrach and Morgan's model is that Miller makes a clear distinction between childbearing intentions and childbearing desires. So basically demographers pay a lot of attention to intentions, but what Miller recognizes is that there is some state in between. It's not that when we see high benefits of having children, we automatically go to planning children. There needs to be one step, one interim step, which is formation of childbearing desires. And this desire describes more what a person wants to do. It's like the ideal end state. Uh, and only afterwards the, the intention is formed. So the whole process, the way Miller conceptualizes it, starts with motivations or so-called motivational traits. Then there are childbearing desires, then intentions, and then behavior. And of course, there are different forces uh, that can influence this process at very different stages. And this, the way it is conceptualized, it's also very useful, in my opinion, when we think of uncertainty in reproductive decision making. Uh, basically, demographers also have been paying a lot of attention to uncertainty, and this uncertainty um, is very often captured at the stage of, in, of uh, intention formation. So basically what we see also in many studies that when the respondents are asked about their intention to have a child, their plan to have a child, they very often give uncertain answers. They say, I don't know, I am not sure. Or they say, well, probably I will have a child or any kind of this, this, um, this kind of answers appear in the surveys, which basically uh, show that many people are very unsure, uncertain about their uh, childbearing plans. But uh, as I said, Miller's model is very useful to conceptualize it because this model allows us to realize one actually very trivial, very simple thing that this uncertainty that we see in the respondents' re replies when they say, I'm not sure if I, if I plan to have a child in the next few years, this can correspond to two things. Well, at least to two things. It can correspond to person being unsure whether he or she should have a, 
should plan to have a child now at this moment, whether the person is in the right moment in his or her life course, whether the circumstances are uh, right for planning to have a child. But this uncertainty may also appear much earlier in the decision-making process. It might actually be related to people's desire. People might be unsure whether they want to have a child in the first place. Of course, it may relate to the first child or to the second child, doesn't matter. I do work a lot on childlessness, but the same applies when we speak of second child or third child. So there are like at least these two big different types of uncertainty that we just notice when the person says, well, I'm not sure if I plan to have a child. I'm not sure if I intend to have a child. The person might be not sure about the timing, about the right moment to have a child, or he or she might be uncertain about whether they want to have a child uh, at all. Hold on, I will need. If I'm uh, one, one, one technical question, if I at the moment mark something on the slide, can you see it? Yeah, you can see it. Lovely. Thanks, Anna. It might be useful in a moment. Okay, so basically what uh, demographers or population uh, researchers are working on, they are of course looking at these different aspects of uncertainty. And I have to admit, I'm not sure if you prove me wrong, but I think that most attention is being paid to this uncertainty at the later stage of decision-making process. So a lot of attention is being paid to external sources external factors of uh, uncertainty uh, in intentions. And Daniela, your and your team and your grant is also a great example here. Economic uncertainty. Uh, I believe you might argue with me and we may go into the, the deeper discussion, but I think this, this economic uncertainty is much more important at the stage of the intention formation. What I want to look at, what we want to look at within the grant that uh, we are currently conducting is to take a look in, onto the earlier stages. So we want to focus precisely on psychological determinants that might be important for motivation development and for desires development. So as I said, a much more psychological twist and uh, going more in depth with people's motivations. Of course, we will not ignore those external factors. They are also very important. And there are some, there is some research that also uh, touches upon these topics, but our primary focus is on psychological determinants that are important for uh, those motivations and desires. So we may actually say that um, the, the main, questions that we ask ourselves in this research grants is what are psychological determinants of weak or uncertain childbearing motivations and desires? Why are some people ambivalent or indifferent about parenthood? Why they have doubts whether parenthood is something good for them? This is really our, our starting point and our main, main research question. And what I will do in, the, in this presentation, I will try to give you a brief overview of different elements that we are looking at related to these research questions. And I have already mentioned, uh, actually the second question here already gives you some hints uh, as to on which aspects we're looking at, namely one of the important things that we are looking at is ambivalence. So uh, one of the topics that we are exploring is ambivalence in people's uh, motivations. And this is also one of the reasons why Miller's model was very attractive to us. Let me start with saying that uh, Joanna Lechniak, so one of the PhD students, she's the one who mostly works on the topic. And as I said, the attractiveness of the Miller's model is also related to the fact that Miller quite explicitly distinguishes between positive and negative childbearing motivations, as I have already explained before. And this distinction is important because this is precisely what ambivalence is about. Ambivalence is about coexistence 
of strong positive and strong negative feelings towards an object. So this is one thing that we are looking into. We're looking at uh, whether such ambivalence occur, when it occurs. And I think uh, it's pretty straightforward. I hope it's pretty straightforward what I mean by ambivalence, but just to give you the, the, the more precise concept, basically, if we consider that we have two separate dimensions, positive motivations and negative motivations, then you can have these four types of uh, positions, attitudes in, in people. You might have, of course, some clear predispositions. You might have people who have who see very few positive aspects of childbearing and a lot of negative aspects of childbearing, and they will be antenatal. You can, of course, see people who are total the total opposite of that. So they see many positive aspects. They react favorably towards different aspects of childbearing, and they see few negatives. So they are, of course, pronatal. But for us in this research project, these two, these two dimensions are far more interesting. So those who see both high positive and high negative uh, uh, consequences of having children, and those who are indifferent also, these are also they are also they also might be uh, uncertain about whether they want to have a child or not. And uh, what is at the moment uh, Joanna working on? She's trying to see how people classified to these different categories differ in their childbearing des desires, childbearing intentions. Uh, she's using different approaches to classify people. So, uh, for instance, we're looking at um, empirical uh, clustering, so cluster analysis to distinction these different types of people. And just to give you a hint, just to give you the idea of the results, this is the uh, this is the um, the results of the regression analysis when dependent variable is childbearing desire. Uh, we controlled for standard uh, sex union, uh, union status and education. This is analysis done for only childless individual. And you can see the um, beta coefficients for people in different categories. And actually, uh, ambivalent is the reference category in this case, and all other categories, they have significantly different fertility desires from those ambivalent. It can be said that these ambivalent are somewhere between pronatal and atenatal, but they are also different from those indifferent, so those who have, uh, who perceive few benefits and few costs of childbearing. Uh, but this is a very simple classification, but in psychology there are also, uh, there have been a lot of uh, indexes proposed to actually evaluate the strength of this ambivalence. So what Joanna is also looking at, she's looking at those different index uh, indices. And the index I'm showing you here is not the best one. And it's not the one that Joanna is using in her research, but it's the simplest one. It's just to illustrate, just to give you the impression of how it is calculated. Basically those indexes are calculated, taking into consideration the strength of positive and negative motivations. And we can then basically assess the strength of ambivalence in uh, reproductive decision-making. So this is something that Joanna will be, Joanna will be looking at in more details. She will be also looking at more direct measures of those ambivalence. So we will be also trying to see how people perceive, express their mixed feelings about childbearing. So to sum up altogether her, her research aims, it's to look at different measures of ambivalence in childbearing motivations to also compare those, uh, it's called objective. So these measures that are computed from positive and negative attitudes, but also some subjective opinions, how people experience ambivalence. And she would be also looking at determinants of ambivalence and, at the moment, one of the variables she wants to consider is, for instance, existential fear. How existential fears might lead people to be more 
uncertain, more ambivalent about their childbearing plans. Speaking of fear, there is one other team member who's actually going to look much, much closer on to different types of fears in reproductive decision making, which is Isabella Malitska. She's, uh, she has just started her PhD. We are at the moment developing the, uh, her research plan, but she wants to focus precisely on different fears and worries related to parenthood. And she wants to see how these fears and worries shape motivations and desires for, child, for children. Uh, there, is, uh, there is really a lot of interesting things uh, going on here because on one hand, uh, fear can be related to anxiety. To, so fear is considered very often as even a personality trait, which is related to, to, to being anxious, to being uncertain by nature, so to speak. And if this is how fear is considered, it can be expected that it will have negative impact on childbearing motivations and desires. People might simply be afraid to take on such a big responsibility. But there is also so-called altruistic fear, altruistic fear for somebody. Altruistic fear uh, is a fear that we uh, experience when we worry about our children's well-being. And this type of fear is not necessarily something wrong. It can actually be a positive, it, has, it, it can have uh, a positive effect on childbearing plans. So this is something that um, Isa will be exploring in her PhD. And in the meantime, so she's not too bored in the meantime, she's actually working together with one of the master students, Olivia Piekarska. I actually think Olivia is also in the audience today with us on different sources of worries and concerns uh, for reproductive decision making. And here we are actually using GGS data, Generations and Gender Survey. In the Generations and Gender Survey, Actually, the Swedish team introduced module on uh, different sources of uncertainty. You can see the items here. Basically, uh, there is this question thinking about the future. How much does the following worry you? And you can see there are different aspects listed here. Uh, respondents can evaluate each of them, how worrying those aspects are for them. This, uh, this item, these questions were introduced in the Swedish GGS, but they, they also have been recently used in uh, Norway, and we are at the moment working on the Norwegian data. We are, at the moment, our analysis are only limited to childless individuals, and first thing we looked at was to see whether there are any dimensions of these uh, sources of worries and sources of uncertainty. So first we conducted factor analysis on those items and we actually found that this, uh, different types of worries can be divided into three dimensions. So one dimension is quite straightforward. Two dimensions are quite uh, narrow and quite straightforward. One is related to climate change worries. So concerns related to uh, climate change overpopulation. Other dimension is related to political extremism, weakened, weakened de democracy and so forth. And uh, actually the first dimension, the biggest dimension, the dimension that captures most of this item is related to economic and safety, we might say. And uh, so basically this, uh, these are the three types of different, the three types of uncertainty sources. That's how to put it, I think. And what we looked at is uh, we looked at how this, three different sources, three different types of worries, how they determine childbearing intentions, attitudes, uh, childbearing ideals. We are actually, that the, one of the reasons why we are using the Norwegian data is uh, that in the Norwegian GGS, uh, there is also a set of questions on positive and negative attitudes towards children incorporated. So we can really look at, uh, at different uh, motivational variables as the outcome variables. So basically, that's the, that's the layout. 
we take the factors as the explanatory variable and uh, we have the dependent we have different dependent variables childbearing motivations a young number of children or childbearing intention and as said at the moment we just look at childless individuals uh, the model is controlled for sex age union status and education and we actually found that for all of these variables all of these dependent variables the pattern is very similar it's basically the same pattern for all of all of them. Uh, one variable has positive effect. One source has one source of uncertainty of worries has positive effect. The other one has negative, and the third one has none. I'm not sure if you can guess. So basically, to our surprise, the more people are worried about this aspect, the more children they want, the more eager they are to plan children. Uh, and uh, so these are the worries that are actually uh, encouraging think, uh, reproductive choices. And I know it's surprising, but it's not that surprising if you come back to Natalie's presentation when she was talking about the theory of terror management. So we were, we were surprised, we were, we were expecting something different, but uh, there are some psychologists, actually for psychologists, psychologists were not that surprised. I was surprised. I'm not a hardcore psychologist, so I was surprised, but uh, psychologists were like, yeah, sure, this is what you do. This is what happens when you consider the uh, evolutionary psychology. This is quite logical outcome. On the other hand, the climate change worries had negative impact. So um, that's also interesting. And the third dimension turned out insignificant. Yes, Honorata. Uh, sorry, maybe clarify one thing because I'm also not a psychologist so I don't fully understand but I think that uh, the uh, well as I understand it the positive sign stems from the fact that uh, following evolutionary psychology the more children you want you have the greater the chance that some of them will survive is that it uh, among other things it's okay. also yeah it's basically this is one of the of the of the reasons. Another another way of thinking or another mechanism is related to the fact that when you feel threatened, when you feel uh, that your external circumstances are very getting very difficult, you want to make sure that your genes survive. So you want to reproduce quickly. You want to okay. make sure that the new generation is born as quick as possible because you know the human race may, may not survive otherwise of course i'm exaggerating a little bit but this is the the, the logic behind this this mechanism here okay interesting Thank we you. may i i mean i was i was uh, this was something that i have not expected uh, i have to say okay but maybe we can leave it for discussion because now i will start to to make a lot of different comments and uh, i will use all, up all the all the time but i'm happy to 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 discuss more in the in the in the discussion section. Uh, all right, so that about uh, different sources of worries and concerns. And speaking of uh, worries related to parenthood, I should also mention the project of Marta Bizek, who's uh, not looking at worries, but she's looking at different challenges related to parenthood. And uh, to be precise, she will be looking, she's looking at in intensive parenting norm. And she's very much interested in looking at how intensive fathering is also related to uh, masculinity. So how men perceive their caring roles, how they see the pressures related to be a good father nowadays. So this is something that she will be working on. At the moment, she's also working together with Magda Martinkowska and Dominika Kalach on how those norms related to intensive parenting is related to people's value uh, value of system, system of values, sorry, value system. Uh, these are the results I will not show you because then I will need to go even deeper in psycho into psychology <laughs> department uh, and I do not want to lose your attention completely. Uh, but we have also some other more psychological elements in the team. Uh, Dominika Kalach will be also looking more closely into identity development. Dominika, in her PhD, she worked on 
uh, identity development and well-being in emerging adulthood at the stage of emerging adulthood. And at the moment, she actually wants to continue this research and look at the identity development in relation to childbearing goals and childbearing motivations. So these are more really like in-depth psychology uh, issues. I want to show you one more research, which is also very psychological, but I actually hope you will find it very interesting. Last but not least, uh, I have not mentioned Isabella Huchewska's research yet. Uh, I'm actually moving uh, backwards. I was speaking about current situation. I was speaking uh, about... Uh, uh, um, uh, Dominika will be looking at the stage of emerging adulthood, and Isabella is looking at childhood experiences. Actually, Isabella in her PhD is uh, considering childhood experiences, experiences, and in particular, sorry, and in particular, so-called childhood parentification and its role for uh, childbearing motivation. Uh, she's also looking in general on childhood experiences. Let me explain what the childhood parentification is, because I'm not sure if you're familiar with the term. Basically, the, child, uh, the parentification is a dysfunctional family dynamics in which parent turns to a child for guidance and support. So it's a role reversal. Actually, a child assumes caregiving responsibility towards a parent. This parentification can have instrumental or emotional form. So instrumental parentification is related to situation when a child is responsible for various household chores, taking care of siblings, or even taking care of parent, especially for instance, if a parent is ill. And emotional parentification is related to the situation when a child is a parent's confidant therapist or mediates family conflict. And this is, uh, as said, this is a fun dysfunctional family dynamics. It's the reversal of the roles. This is not something that children should do. So obviously in the literature, we know that there are numerous negative consequences of childhood parentification, like low self-esteem anxiety, again, fear, uh, different personality disorder. All these things are related to childhood parent to experiencing childhood ex uh, parentification. But actually, inter interestingly enough, uh, under some circumstances, uh, those experiences can also have a positive effect. So if, of course, if it's not to the extreme, but if a child is responsible for things around the house, child um, can also train the, his or her competences may feel useful, helpful. Uh, it may also lead to higher empathy. So there are, under some circumstances, most researchers focus on this negative, adverse consequences of parentification, but under some circumstances, it might have some positive effect. And actually, just also to give you a very first initial results, we actually looked first at different, simply different adverse childhood experiences, like, uh, like the fact that a person experienced parental divorce uh, in childhood, or death of one of the parents, or parents' illness. These are all the things that can actually trigger parentification, that may lead to a child uh, taking on more responsibilities. And if we just look at these adverse childhood experiences, they are related to lower childbearing desire in adulthood. But if we take, if we focus more closely on those possible positive aspects, so if we use a specific set of questions that concentrates on positive outcomes of parentification, positive aspects of parentification, the effect is opposite, actually, uh, then indeed, uh, if a child, if a person perceives some benefits of taking care of the, his or her parents, uh, being more uh, responsible in childhood, it may lead to, to higher, to increase childbearing desires in adulthood. 
So that's that's what we found at the moment. This is only based on the pilot study so far, so not a big sample. So just really, please do consider all these results as very, very tentative initial, but this is uh, what uh, Isabella is looking at, the mo looking at at the moment, and she will be looking into it in more uh, details. Um, I will, hold on, just want to make sure that I'm not missing anything. I will jump one thing. Uh, basically, uh, what I want to finish with is to let you know that these are definitely not the only um, studies, not only analysis, not only things that we are working on. We are also working a little bit on measurement issues. So on one hand, we are trying to uh, propose some good, efficient, reliable, valid tools to really capture childbearing motivations well. On one hand, we do it in a psychological way. This is also mostly uh, Isa's uh, project. She developed with our help the short form of the childbearing questionnaire uh, that can be used even in a somewhat larger surveys. Um, to really well capture the childbearing motivations. Uh, but we also propose the module on childbearing motivations for GGS, for Generations and Gender Survey, together with Alice Raybould. This, uh, this uh, module has been now par partially tested in Norway. So we are also trying to bring more awareness to the demographic community that uh, intentions are not the first thing to look at, that there are other things to look before we look at the intention stage. Uh, I think this is all I wanted to share with you today. I hope that it gives you, I know it was really like a very wide general picture, but I really wanted to paint this general picture to show you really just what we are working on, what we are planning to work on. Uh, so far, we have been mostly using secondary data or pilot data, and actually some of the results we will be presenting at the EPC. So I'm sure we'll all meet at the EPC in Groningen, in person or online, but I'm pretty sure many of us will be there. So feel free to also visit us um, at our presentations. We will be showing some results related to ambivalence. We will be presenting some results uh, related to parentification. Uh, Marta will have a presentation on intensive parenting. So there are definitely some uh, interesting results to share with you there. And we are actually getting at the moment ready for primary data collection this year. As you can see, we are really, uh, the, the team is, psychological team. We are psychologists. We want to go more in depth. So unfortunately, GGS data or any other available data do not give us such an opportunity. So we will be collecting more in depth uh, detailed data this year. So we are also planning at the moment uh, how, to, how to conduct it. So I hope that uh, in a couple of, uh, let's say in a year's time, I will be able to share many more results beyond those very tentative initial findings. And of course, feel free to follow us on the research gate. We will be putting all our findings there, even if they are not yet uh, published. All right, thank you for your attention.